So thanks a lot for the very kind uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, I'll try to speak slowly. If you have any problem or if there is anything which isn't clear, because there will be a lot of things that are about the European context and the Italian context. So please do stop me and uh, you know, uh, don't be worried about asking any question even even during the talk and of course uh, the after. I'll try to be short. Uh, but I, I have to do, you know, I have to do an introduction to the talk, which is not only about the talk and, and uh, as to be on, on the reasons why I'm here today. So first of all, I'm, I'm very happy, uh, you know, to get the invitation from Sofia, with whom I've shared like three years of doctoral work, and like, you know, like we shared a little eater at some point, even working at night in our department. So we had a, a very great experience of working together through hard British wet and, and cold conditions. And so for me, uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here and to see her so engaged with her students. Yesterday, I was particularly happy to see how much care she has with her own students. And that's the thing, you know, all the, all the good principles that we, that we all share in the care of, of progressive knowledge. Because progressive knowledge, it's, it's about research, it's about all of that, but the first thing is about taking care of, of students and of his, own, of his own or her own students. And so I was very happy to see uh, to see that and also to meet me now, which I didn't know, but you know, we had amazing conversation yesterday evening for a long time and also uh, with Professor with Professor Wong. So it's, it's beautiful, first of all, from a human point of view to be here, besides, besides the reception which uh, I'm, going, I'm going through. So the departing point of, of the talk of today and of my last, last, last reflection, and I'm, I'm telling you, what I'm presenting you today it has been a published work, but it's something you know in, in current evolution. So, like, also from from the empirical point of view. But I start from from uh, from uh, from an observation. Uh, critical thinking in Europe has not been engaged in politics after the 1970s. So, what we had after the 1970s, after May 1968 and the big uprise uh, in Europe following May 1968 is the critical thinkers have continued to do their work without having much contact with, with politics, uh, with, with doing politics. And this has been an effect of what has been lived in Europe as a cultural defeat uh, of, of, of the critical left. And in this environment, policy and politi politics advice have been mainly given by economists or people working on quantitative uh, issues. Now, I do a lot of quantitative research, and I'm a quantitatively geared researcher, but I, but I can see the problem of that. Uh, and the problem in the fact that critical thinking has been out of the picture in terms of political influence in countries has generated a lower level of critical, or critical reflection around, around centered matters, and specifically some of them, uh, some of the ones I'm, I'm going to talk about today. But today we have an interesting new term. In Europe, and I've been, you know, experiencing that. Last week, I was in a conference at the University of Essex uh, uh, about the heritage of Ernesto Laclau, which is a big political philosopher of populism. And at that symposium, uh, one year after his death, there were MPs of Syriza in Greece and uh, and uh, the General Secretary of Podemos in Spain. What, what do I mean by that? Besides the political effect, is that there is, in a sense a getting closer, again, of critical theory with politics. So, uh, uh, the leader of Podemos, I don't know how much you follow in European politics, Pablo Iglesias, has a PhD in political science and has a PhD in critical theory. Uh, one of the most famous MPs of Syriza, who just got elected, is Kostas Lapavitsas, who was professor of critical economic thinking at SOAS University in London. And these things didn't happen over the last 40 years. So there is, in a sense, a getting back of critical thinking uh, into, into politics. And this, and this is interesting. This book that I'm going to present today, it's all about it. It's all about using critical theories. It's all about bringing back empirics together with critical theory to discuss about the political development and the political alternatives in the specific of Italy and and Mediterranean society, but I think there is a lot to talk about also for, for you from the Korean perspective on how these changes and these common changing changes that we are living all affect us and bring a new reflection on political and social and social action. One anecdote about this book is that this book has been conceived and written in six months, uh, together with Alessandro Rigoni, that now works close to me and is a researcher at the University of Oxford. 
And I don't want to say that to praise or to say that it was a superficial work or to pray myself for a very quick work. It's just that the book came out as a very natural thing because I believe it's embedded in the time in the time we're living, and uh, and it, it's all about the common the common debates that we are experiencing about the change in the labor market, growing inequalities, and the role of politics and political action in, in addressing in addressing some of these problems. So it's of course a long trip, and uh, most of my empirical work you, you can find as relation with that. My work on, on the welfare state that Sophia was mentioning, my work on family policy, but also my work on social capital and political actions all feed into a larger perspective. Uh, on, on, political, on political action. And beyond this book, as I was promising you, there is a lot of empirical work, but there is also a lot of uh, 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 critical thinkers uh, beyond, beyond the scenes. As one of my favorite scholars, uh, Robert Merton, Robert Merton is this American sociologist who wrote like one of his greatest books, it's not an academic book, it's a, it's a sort of novel on the idea of stepping on the shoulders of giant. So basically, Merton wrote an, an history on how uh, this expression, stepping on the shoulders of giants, came, that you find on the Google uh, search engine today, came about. And, and I think you know, all critical reflections that we do is basically stepping on the shoulders of giants. And so you know, this book has a, lot of, uh, has a lot of influence on many different things. And I want to briefly highlight them before going into the, into the discussion. First, there is a lot of Karl Marx uh, in this book, and, but it's not the Karl Marx that we use in the capital, but it's more the Karl Marx of the Grundisse, the Karl Marx of the theory of value. Uh, and there's something I think it speaks a lot to a Korean audience. What, 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 is, what, is, what is the value we are, we are searching for? What is the meaning of our actions? Why do we do certain things to enhance development? What is the end value? What is the meaning of it? These kind of questions are not being asked for the, last, for the last 40 years, because the answer was very obvious. The value is increasing the GDP. The value is increasing the level of formal economy. Now, one might wonder today in Europe, and today in Korea, and today in the United States, and in many other places, if we don't have to readdress this question of value. And this question of value, you know, Marx was approaching it in terms of labor and capital, but today can be approached in very, very different, very, very different way on how labor and capital to interact. But I, I won't go into that, I'll just give you the provocation. I mean, this will take me out of, of the topic. A second big influence is André Gortz and post-laborism. Post so going beyond the wage-based society, as you will see in the talk. A third great influence is, of course, the work on Polanyi. And a part of the book is called The Great Transformation. And I'll, I'll like, what do I mean today by The Great Transformation? Uh, stacking on the shoulders of Polanyi's to, to sketch the portrait of what we are living in Europe. Another big source of inspiration are Latin American thinkers and people heavily working on inequalities, but not only Latin American thinkers in the sense of academics, but also in the sense of scholars. And I think a work that you, you should read, because it tells you a lot about Latin America, but tells you a lot about development, is, is The Open Vein of Latin America uh, by Galeano. And I think you know it's a good way of reconceiving our own ideas of development and what it comes, it comes to. This work has a lot in terms of social engagement coming from the English, English tradition. And E.P. Thompson, I don't know if you ever encounter him in your studies, but the reconfiguration of the idea of class. The class is not as only Marx was, was referring to into economic terms, but class is something of, uh, uh, related to the experience of common, of common people and the common, common history of people. And E.P. Thompson in his monumental book, The Making of the English Working Class, has gone beyond the Marxian tradition in describing how people were gathering and getting together. And a final giant, which is an impression on this book, is a giant that is getting very fashionable nowadays, but it's still not that fashionable anymore in his own country of origin, uh, very interestingly, which is Antonio Gramsci which is now is used everywhere in social science, but in Italy is denied because of his, uh, uh, in a sense, his belonging, and his, you know, he was the founder of the Communist Party, so people don't manage to have uh, a clean and honest and genuine academic debate on Gramsci in Italy because it was so ideologically loaded, but we don't mind about that, and we pick up from Gramsci concepts like Fordism, hegemony, passive revolution to describe uh, what is happening. So, coming to the book. 
The aim of the book is a reflection on how to reactivate the invisible majority, or what we define invisible majority, I will go in a minute to the definition of it, to fight against systemic inequality. If we today we don't fight against inequality, we argue in the book, especially in Mediterranean countries, but more generally, is because people who would have the interest to fight against them, they don't realize that they have a common interest in doing it. And, and the, the book uh, starts from this premise to try to think how to rethink the disadvantage in a strength uh, in progressive uh, terms. You know, one, one common thing that has happened in the debate, certain words have disappeared from the debate. For 30 years, another coming back. The success of Piketty book, The Capital, is not a random coincidence. Uh, although, you know, there are problems with the analysis in, in these books and many things that have been discussed, but the word redistribution is coming back. And together with this word, there are other words that are coming back, uh, that, that have been in the background for a very long time. One word is class, that I was saying. You know, we had a lot of work on class as society and also the people taking back the attitude to, of class and discussing that. The idea of social conflict has been undermined in Europe uh, for a very long time. In a sense, we don't need conflict anymore. We just need to improve society scientifically and all the work on the third way. The idea of hegemony, as I was telling you, something that we, we didn't use for a long time and now it's back in use of a lot, creating hegemony in society and hegemonic thinking. And the other one is the word universalism, which for a very long time was seen as a word that we shouldn't use, you know, something that brings back very, very old concept. And new words that are emerging and that we use in the book to, to elaborate a new way of thinking. One is about efficient egalitarianism, so getting away from this idea that egalitarianism is inefficient. You know, there's been a lot of thinking on the trade-off between equality and efficiency. What well, we said in the Italian case, at least, there is no trade-off. Uh, equality in the Italian case, in many respects, will make and contribute for efficiency. And in the slides that I've sent, uh, there is a lot of reflection and reflection on, on this. We, we use other words like selective neoliberalism is that neoliberalism in Italy has not been applied to everybody, but to certain categories in the population in a very specific way, and this population is the invisible majority that I'm going to describe. We use words like labor dogma, on the idea that labor is culture, and the culture of former labor has been going so far that it's conditioning our way of defining work. Think today about the studies on precariousness and outsiderness. Work has changed, but we continue to analyze work with all categories. Looking at the type of contract of people today doesn't make any sense, but we continue to do research in this way, including myself. And you know, this is something we will discuss more over this workshop, and this is something I'm thinking about in a grant proposal uh, uh, to work on. And finally, the idea of social productivity, getting away from the idea of formal and economic productivity that we had, uh, to go more into an idea of social productivity, which goes beyond the simple boundaries of what we mean by productivity uh, today. So the talk structure is in four parts. Uh, the first one I'm going to define, this invisible majority I've been advocating. Second, I'm going to talk and describe the great transformation. I'll do it very quickly, but I'm happy then to get questions because it's a quite a complex part of the book. Uh, I will talk a bit about the vote and the organization and the rational for action of this invisible majority, as we've seen in Italy, but also in Spain at this point and in Greece. And then I will go to uh, the conclusion. So first of all, who is the invisible majority? The invisible majority in Italy is constituted by 25 million people. Why they are a majority? It's because these 25 million people have, uh, could vote, a majority of them, uh, and in Italy, there are only 41 million voters. So if these people uh, uh, will be, in a sense, binded together by an electoral proposal, these people will be a very, very strong uh, majority. But of course, this invisible majority doesn't exist, in a sense. Some people was joking on the newspapers, on a big right-wing newspapers in Italy, uh, uh, reviewing my book, they said, that I should have called that the inesistente, la maggioranza inesistente, so a majority that doesn't exist rather than the invisible, invisible one. Who are these people? These people are unemployed people. These people are neat, what we commonly define neat. People are not in employment, education, or training. Poor pensioners. I mean, in Italy, we always frame the debate as poor against old. It doesn't work. It's absolutely false. I've been trying to say that for years in Italy. It's not a war between young people and old people. It's a war, a conflict, 
better to say, between guaranteed and non-guaranteed. And among the non-guaranteed, there are people who earn less than 500 euros for their pension uh, in Italy. The four categories, of course, are the precarious or atypical workers, which are a paradigmatic group uh, within these invisible majorities, I'm going to say, and the migrant. Italy today has almost 6 million migrants. We didn't conceive Italy as a country of migration, but over the last 10 years, the number of migrants has been multiplied by three in the country. And so these people are a big social force, even if they don't vote, most of them don't vote yet. This invisible majority is all, has in common many things. It is marginalized, but not marginal. So it's marginalized within the formal economy. But if you look beyond the boundaries of the formal economy, this invisible majority does a lot of things that keep the society together. A lot of migrants illegally work and take care of people performing care jobs, which we, we've seen that very expensive. We've discovered with formalization of family policy that care is expensive. Uh, we didn't realize that during Fordism because women were doing that for free. But also other invisible uh, links uh, keep, keep together this invisible majority. Think, for example, about all the work that precarious workers do in sectors with very low productivity rates. So they keep together industry, they keep the country alive by doing a lot of work being paid very little uh, uh, in, and with the reduction of their wages. And this is an effect of the Great Transformation, as I'm going to show. And so these people are not people who are unproductive, but these people might have a low productivity according to the form of productivity that we love in economics. But if you look at the social productivity of these people, it might be much higher, and at some point, we might would think about, might would think about rewarding them uh, for what they do. And the precariat, well, or precarious worker, or typical workers, I prefer to define them, because I, I don't buy completely the notion of the precariat, as guys standing as put it, as a monoblock, as a single group, like, this could be <laughs> the theme of another talk, but uh, the, the atypical workers are the paradigmatic a paradigmatic group, because before they didn't exist. Uh, in Italy, we, we, didn't, we didn't define precarious workers, but today we are starting to recognize certain type of specific conditions, and in doing that, we are on the making of a group. You can look through history. Uh, people today use ideas like, oh yeah, today it's impossible to reorganize workers because uh, they're not a, an homogeneous group. But the working class wasn't an homogeneous group at all before getting organized and using his own strength. And so the use and the labeling of certain terms has an impact on the way we construct social reality. So the precariat, or the atypical workers, better to say, are a paradigmatic group within the invisible majority because they're already recognizable, much more recognizable than most, most of the others. What binds these people together? Two things. One is the interest in redistribution of income and wealth and opportunities at a very you know, basic level in Mediterranean countries. Uh, and, and the other one is the idea of universalism. All these people will profit from the provision of universal services. To understand why this is so important, you need to place yourself into the Mediterranean context where the welfare state is focused on cash transfer. So we give money to people, but we don't give services because there was a very vested and strong political interest in keeping part of the population happy by giving them money, but we didn't build up services. Italy has an underdevelopment in terms of childcare, uh, big, big problems in terms of elderly care, and so forth. So all this invisible majority has the interest for shifting the welfare state from a cash-based welfare state into a service-based universal uh, welfare state. And here, don't get trapped into this debate on spending. Uh, it's not a problem of the amount of spending, it's a problem of quality. Italy spent as much as Finland in terms of percentage of the GDP for social policy, but our spending has a much lower quality because our welfare state spending, for example, in the case of pension, and, and, and you have slides about that, unfortunately I cannot go too much into that, but we spend a lot of money for pensions. Italy spent 15% of the GDP for pensions, and basically what we do with pensions is that we increase inequalities more than the labor market has already created. So basically our Gini coefficient among pensioners is higher than the Gini coefficient of people in the labor market. Now, even if you are a liber liberal, very neoliberal economist, you cannot buy this. It doesn't make any sense that inactive people have such a big reward for doing, for doing what? So, you know, 
Uh, so it's not a problem of spending. It's not a problem of spending, but it's a problem of distributing uh, spending at first. And then there is also a problem of, of the areas in which we do spend. So the great transformation I was telling you, and, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I will give very quickly, I will go very quickly through that, uh, but this is a big, big theme of debate, so please ask questions if things are not clear, if you, if you want to challenge the story that I'm telling. So the, there are four elements of the great transformation in Polanyi's words, readapted today. First, the intellectual, political, and economic triumph of neoliberalism. Uh, uh, it, it, it is an idea that is one, and I think that the main point is intellectual. You remember, I said at the outset of my talk, I told you that all people that work with politicians today are people that do quants or economists, and that's one of the reasons why today we are intellectually unable to reverse austerity measures. Everybody has been realizing that austerity measures do not work in Europe, but nobody seems to have an answer, a credible answer to reverse that. And in my opinion, this has happened because for 40 years, critical thinking has been too worried about the multitude or using Spinoza and abstract thinking, like, you know, uh, a good uh, uh, professor, very famous Italian professor like Tony Negri. Uh, actually, I shouldn't call him professor, he's not a formal professor anymore, but a big intellectual like Tony Negri, rather than getting occupied with the political economy and the critical thinking of, of political economy. The second element is it's the euro. It's the euro and the creation of a common currency without solidarity. Now, you know, if, if you study a bit of economics, you know that an optimal area in economics needs to have a free movement of labor market and financial incentives. This doesn't happen in Europe. And so if you don't have compensation for the poor areas and people are moving, you have a big problem because you have different economic cycles and then you know you get into the debate like the one between Germany and Greece are experiencing today. Again, you know, I'm really simplifying and I'm happy to discuss more about it. The third element of the great transformation is the lack of coverage of the welfare state and the emergence of new social risks, as many people have put that, but this is particularly bad in Mediterranean countries. Our welfare state doesn't cover at all. So if you are a typical worker and you get unemployed, in Italy you basically have no coverage. And I think this situation is quite similar uh, to the one of many people in Korea. So if you if you are a typical worker with like form of contracts which are not, you know, in the canonic. Uh, uh, in the canonic uh, way, you know, framed, you have no, no insurance, no unemployment insurance. Now, it's not a problem of contract, as I was telling you, we need to reattach rights to people rather than the work they do. Uh, but that's a very, very complex type of debate uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean context. And the fourth uh, element of uh, the Great Transformation, it has been the, bl the blindness of the left, and what we call in the book in a very provocative way the requiem of the left. is basically the Social Democratic Party uh, after the 70s has been sitting there and accepting this change. If we internalize a uh, neoliberal, neoliberal party, I mean, the most paradigmatic example is set in the third way of, of Tony Blair. And in a sense, if you accept all this party, you're not alternative anymore. Now, you know, I'm not questioning the choices of politicians on this ground. What I'm only saying is, if your values, and if you accept the value that society is a society constituted by, you know, so if you want to differentiate the left and the right, there's one very basic distinction. For the right, society is made, you have two types of right, right? You have the conservative right for which is the nation that matters, and all the arms of the nation, doesn't matter which class we belong to. Then you have a, a liberal, very liberal vision, which is the fact that society is made up of individuals, like in the uh, Smith conception, and and by the, the self-interest of people with developed society. And then you have a third vision, the one on the left, the socialist vision, which was that society is constituted by groups that have a conflict between each other. What has happened with the third way is that the left or the social democrats have accepted the liberal vision. Now, perfectly fine. That was a strategy to win elections. But the effect of that in the long run is that there is no more much difference uh, between this political proposal. And I think, you know, one of the interests of the emergence of parties like Podemos and Syriza today in Greece is that they embrace more Syriza than Podemos, uh, uh, all social democratic parties. What Syriza proposes is nothing revolutionary, as many people have said. 
Syriza is an old fashion social democratic parties, the social democratic parties of, of the origin. And, and their victory is explainable in this scheme and the, and the decline of the PASOK, which is, which is the, Greek, uh, the, Greek socialist, the Greek socialist party. Now, I mean, I don't know if this was clear. I was, you know, I've been sketching like 150 pages of book in, in five minutes, and this is always hard, and these are big themes of the political economy. But I think it's more interesting that I leave more space for the discussion, and I maybe disentangle some of this point, and I go into the meat of the third part of, of the book, which is basically uh, how do we activate, and how is the visible majority showing up? So why, why you know, me and, and Alessandro Rigoni wake up in the morning and say, oh, there is an invisible, there is an invisible majority. Well, the idea of the book was plastic, represented by the Italian vote in 2013. Now, you need to know that in Italy over the last 20 years, m many of you might have heard of Berlusconi, right? I suppose we made, we made a globe, you know, we, we, we made it around the globe with Berlusconi. But what has happened in Italy is that for the last 20 years, you had on the one hand a right-wing coalition run by Berlusconi, and on the other side, you had a center-left coalition run, Prodi was the most important figure at some point, but you had many, many other people have been feeding into it. What we argue in the book, in a very provocative way, is that Berlusconi was like, a, uh, you know, like, you know when you go to a discotheque and you have uh, the big lights that are played in the room. Now, you're dancing the same music and the room is always the same, but you are very attracted by this light, and this light seems to change the context in which you're in, which is always a discotheque. So Berlusconi didn't change Italian politics. And the cleavage between the center-right and the center-left just didn't exist. Labor market politics and the harsher reform of the labor market were made by the center-left. It was the center-left that multiplied the number of contracts, making it possible the exploitation of many atypical workers. It was the center-left that did the first law of migration, making it harder for migrants to get uh, you know, a kind of legal status, increasing the gray areas of exploitation for them. It was the center-left they did the first reforms of the pensions that then have been, have been brought forward, which didn't touch the guaranteed. That's a very important argument of my book. We divide Italian society in three groups. You have the neoliberal, who want neoliberal reforms. The guaranteed that follow the trade unions and the so-called left-wing trade unions, and then the invisible majority unprotected uh, in, this, in this entire context. So what we argue in the book is that, uh, you know, there was no cleavage. Despite the presence of Berlusconi, and such caricatural character, there was no difference in the political offer. And then in 2013, this, this, this contention is materialized by the emergence of a new party that get 25% of the vote with a very strange proposal, which is basically saying, these people are the caste, these people are bad, these people are corrupt, we want to replace them, the Five Star Movement. The problem was that this party didn't have a new political proposal. So this party made true, got 25%. Italy got transformed for a bipolar uh, field. The political field went from being bipolar to be tripolar, with a very big problem. And the, the majority that is in power today is the same majority elected in 2013. We just shifted. So now Renzi is the president. But the parliament is the same. We had Mario Monti, if you remember, in 2011, a technical government in Italy which was basically, oh, we cannot fix our problems with politics, we get a technical government, voted by the center-left and the center-right together, like a gross coalition in Germany. Then we had elections. We didn't manage to have a majority. We had Letta, which was another technocrat. And then we had Renzi, which is the new face of Italy, which is a character with many similarities with Berlusconi, uh, in many respects, a bit more serious, uh, young, a new profile. But the policies are exactly the same. So despite Italy has seen an election in 2013 in which 16 million voters out of the 41 million voters voted in a different way, in Italy vote is very stable, you need to know that. Less than 5 million voters have been shifting. And even with the old scandals that we had in the 1990s, only 10 million voters shifted. In the 2013 election, 16 million voters did vote differently from last time. And the answer of the political system, you know what it was? doing the same type of government. And that's where the whole idea of the invisible majority has come up. And when you look at the vote, when you look at the microdata on vote, you see that the invisible majority 
and a part, a consistent part of the visible majority, especially the unemployed and the precarious people, have massively voted for the Five Star Movement. They didn't vote for the Five Star Movement because they were convinced by the political offer, because there was no political offer, but they were distrusting the center-left and the center-right who has done nothing for the invisible majority. Now there is a, a substantive bit of this invisible majority, which are the propensionists, that do not vote with them. And that's, you know, the big uh, problem, because these people continue to vote, in a sense, for the center-left and the center-right. And this, you know, doesn't create the majority as as, as we are defining. If you look in 2014 elections, we had European elections, same thing. Renzi won the elections, but the invisible majority didn't vote for the center-left or the center-right. Most of the invisible majority didn't go to vote. And we had a very low turnout, 58, 58%. So the invisible majority, in a sense, has decided elections in Italy, but didn't have any influence in the political outcome because the policies are exactly the same. And that's why in the last chapter of the book, we argue uh, that it's not simply a problem of vote. It's a problem of, of social action. And that's where again, you know, Gramsci uh, comes, comes back to the fore. We think that there are three potential movements in which an invisible majority can express, can express itself. And here is where really the book moves out of academia to go more into normative, normative arguments. I mean, it's important uh, to make this distinction because this is our vision of potential challenge in society of social groups coming from social movement theory and from Antonio Gramsci. First, this invisible majority need to construct or to be able to construct a common interest that we highlight all through the book. All these people have a common interest to redistribution and the creation of universal, of universal uh, services. And this common interest is counterposed to the interest of neoliberals and guaranteed. The neoliberals, of course, want to continue into the way of liberalizing Italian economy, also against the guaranteed, so reducing the rights also people of good jobs, like my mother, which never understood my book, which is a good sign. And you know, you need to know about her. She, she, she's part of the trade unions. She's She's considered herself more left-wing than I am, because there is an internal fight there, because the guarantee think that they are left. And so you have a war uh, between the neoliberal and the guarantee that has been there on the fall. So you have the trade unions against the government, but there you have the third element, the invisible majority, which is not represented by political parties, which is not represented by unions, that is there as a product, as a byproduct of the invisible of the great transformation I was trying to highlight. And there, in this second moment of recognition, what we theorize is that the invisible majority need to conceptualize his own interest for universalism and redistribution by looking at all the social classes. You all have heard this history about the squeeze middle, right? The fact that the middle class is getting poorer. Now, in Italy, you have a very interesting phenomenon according to so you have two theories that support you. One is neoliberal, like one is it's, it's a rational choice theory, more than neoliberal. A rational choice theory of vote that tells you that when the median and the mean vote are getting uh, far away, you will have a demand for a distribution of the Madsen, Madsen model. You see the difference. So the median is basically if you count people and you divide the income distribution in half, and the mean, you pick up the total value of income and you divide by 50%. So if the median and the mean are getting far away, if the median goes down, so there are more and more uh, uh, people that are below uh, this uh, uh, median income, it means that inequalities are increasing. And so you should have a demand for a distribution. But we are arguing that this is not enough. It's not enough that people are experiencing larger inequalities to act against them. And so the second argument is to bring back into the political debate in Europe the idea of conflict. The idea that we don't live in societies in which the interest of people is the same. The interest of people is not the same. And actually an overwhelming majority of Italian people, the invisible majority and the middle class, would have the interest to redistribute and to create universal services. Because the fact of having a public childcare is not only an interest for the poor, a typical worker. It's also in the interest of the middle class. 
And so it's in the moment in which the demand of this invisible majority will get closer to the one of the middle class that you would have a change or a, poli or a demand for political change. This, in a sense, it's starting to happen in Greece. Because if you look at the geography of the vote of Syriza, it's not only poor people that are voting for them. It's a lot of former electorate of the Socialist Party that are starting to vote for Syriza. Now, I don't know what is going to happen, and the, and the deal uh, that has been done in Europe doesn't change still yet things. Like, we are a, a situation which is suspended for the four or six months. But you see, the people have shifted their preferences in Greece, in the Greek case, because Greece has been very hit. Uh, by, by the crisis, and the difference with Italy is in the, in the level of wealth. Italy is a much wealthier country, so people have not, so the middle class has not experienced a fall in consumption uh, like, the Greek, like the Greek one, but this might happen uh, quite, uh, quite soon. And so, you know, there is a third moment that we say, politics and party politics, and that's the reason why it doesn't work anymore, trade unions, all these things cannot work at the national level. We need to get out of this. We cannot think that we were defending poor people or workers at the national scale. It does not work. Because if everybody, and we have experienced that during austerity measures, if the German trade unions defend their own worker, what they do is that they send the consequences of austerity measures out of the working class or the poor people in other countries. So the only thing we can do in Europe is to reconceptualize the idea of the invisible majority at a more European level. And so the idea of social conflict is not anymore an idea of Italy versus Germany or Italy or Greece versus Germany as it is often conceived, but it's an idea of democratic civil conflict between the invisible majority in Greece that look at the precarious worker, the mini jobbers in Germany as allied against the ruling and financial elite in many countries. To bring that to a conclusion, and uh, uh, I know I've raised more points of question probably than, than solving answers, and, that's, and that's, that was the aim. But to conclude, why the invisible majority is voiceless? It's voiceless because of the great transformation that I've been trying to sketch out, and the triumph of neoliberalism, so people feel alone more and more. But the second important reason is internal. It's because these people do not recognize themselves, because these people don't understand, and they clearly have the strength to reverse the system. That was the big discovery the trade unions and social democratic parties have done in Europe over the 20th, over the 20th century. With the shift from the Fordist economy to a service economy, these boundaries have been destroyed. And that's why it's so hard to reconceptualize uh, things uh, in, this, in this term. But we have only one alternative to the austerity measure that we're living in, which is redistribution. And redistribution which is within countries, so a redistribution within, from the guaranteed and the neoliberal to the invisible majority, uh, to put that in the terms of the book, but another one which is at the European level, basically from Germany to Greece. Uh, because Germany, not, not because of charity, because Germany got a lot of advantages of the construction of the Union, while Mediterranean countries are suffering uh, a lot of them. And the third point is the universalization of services, not simply for moral principles or moral ground, but on efficiency principles. Because shifting from cash-based welfare state to service-based welfare state is in the interest also of most of the uh, European, uh, European of the middle class. And together uh, with this shift in the services, we need to be, the, to be very well aware that we need to recognize the informal work of people which is not accounted for in the GDP. And until we don't get to this point, we're going to be unable to have a new perspective. And that's where, you know, I think Andre Gortz, it's something that you should absolutely read. So Metamorphoses of Work and Reclaiming Work are fundamental books for our year reconceptualizing societies in a, in, a, in a progressive way. And so to bring that to, to a conclusion, we don't need to be scared about ideologies. That's, that's what I always keep telling to my students. We need to be able to distinguish between the analysis of reality, what I've been trying to sketch in the first part with the Great Transformation, from the normative consequences that we get from that and the stance we want to take for. So the moment of the analysis we do, and we have to do that in a proper way, but then it's the moment of the ideology, the moment of the ideas, of which we don't have to be scared of. But we just need to be very transparent and clear about that. 
And so the forgotten mission of ideologists today is to provide hope uh, uh, to people. The hope we can fight uh, to readdress an unfair system, starting simultaneously from personal stories of life and collective images. That's what ideology has always been about, is to link the story of each single worker and his problems in a labor market which is getting more and more flexible, together with the collective need of being protected uh, together. And so, you know, like, it happens to me in Italy very often that I've been accused of being ideological by many people, I feel this was an insult. Once I told to a member of the government, I'm ideological, I'm very happy, and there is a fundamental difference between me and you. You're ideological and you don't know about it. I'm consciously ideological after analyzing social reality and taking a stance. So don't be worried about taking a stance after you've done a proper analysis of reality. But don't be ideological without getting a stance and an empirical grasp of what's happening into your, into your society. Don't accept ideologies that come to you on top of your head, but be ideological after a conscious scrutiny of the reality in which, uh, in which you live in. And what I, what I you know, always try to convey in with, this, with this book is that we, we, we need to be brave enough to fulfill a, a duty, uh, which is the duty of looking at the world with new eyes. And these eyes are not forcibly our eyes, but might be the eyes of our neighbor, or the person that is close to us. And you know, in a sense, what we try to do with this book is to look with the eyes of, of the invisible majority. So I don't know if we managed to do that, but that's, that's our hope. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, we know there are losers, we know that, but there are losers, they are outsiders, they are precarious, 
and people will always be uh, uh, disorganized. However, I invite you to a, a bit of optimism, uh, uh, in the sense that these people are restarting to organize. So I've been in Spain, and I'll tell you what I've seen is astonishing. I've seen people, uh, unemployed, long-term unemployed, migrants, uh, reorganizing themselves in towns, reorganizing the economic system by sharing work together, going more in materials, they activated themselves with social movements. In Spain, they call it the Quince de Mayo. Now, I don't want here to give the impression I always believed in party politics. You know, that's the school where I come from. I'm not a social movement person. But I have to tell you that over the last years, what I've seen is that the lack of answer of parties, we, we cannot expect an answer from them. Like in Spain, they cannot expect an answer from the PSOE. Because they're too entrenched into certain logics and defense of certain interests to look at the emergence of that. And so these are spontaneous groups that are recreating themselves. You had all the Ignatius movement uh, uh, in Spain. This Ignatius movement was canalized by the Podemos people. Now, these Podemos people pose us a lot of challenge. I'm, I'm very worried about the populistic language. I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. But what they're claiming is that the left introduced again a popular language to get to the heart of people and remobilize them. In order to answer to the, the second part of your question, we would have to see what they do in elections and if it's possible, even if they get elected, that they can move the boundaries of European politics. I mean, we're seeing how complex it is for Greece. But if Podemos does well in the elections, and I doubt they can get an absolute majority, but they can get an elected majority of the parties, then the, the discussion in Europe will start to look slightly different. If you would have countries and Mediterranean countries joining in with more left wing vote, then, you know, we could have a serious uh, political discussion. And, where, and then we came to the second problem, uh, the vicious cycle of the EU. It's a crisis of representative democracy that we have in Europe. Clear. Like, you know, we, we only need to be blind to not see the crisis of the democracy that we are experiencing. Lower turnout. In Italy, we used to have 85% of turnout. Next national election, we will be It's a problem. Huge problem. It's because people, and besides being or not part of an invisible majority, I realize that decisions are not taken anymore at the national level. They realize that the vote they give for Renzi or for Berlusconi or for another politician doesn't make a huge difference because anyway the decisions are taken elsewhere. Are taken elsewhere from big financial corporations, are taken elsewhere from Europe, are taken by people that are not elected, in a sense, or they are indirectly elected. And that's, you know, if, are we going to be able? to bring these questions for democracy and representativeness within European Union? Because if not, then you know, there are many scenarios that can be open. And the invisible majority, as I put, and we say that in the book, I haven't brought that up, but could be mobilized by fascism, extreme movements of different type. Because on the one hand, the invisible majority in Greece and Spain has been voted, has been both starting to vote for left parties. But in France, in the United Kingdom, partially in Italy, this invisible majority is voting for radical, extreme, xenophobic, nationalistic movements. And so now, that's the challenge we're in. Either we are able to bring these instances in whatever form, but for real, not like in the big sermons that I hear from social democrats in Europe, oh, we will do something. No, like if we really bring these instances of non-representation on the labor market, in terms of social rights, in terms of citizenship. Because we have different levels of citizenship today in Mediterranean countries. We have A citizens and B citizens. If people with a certain type of contracts get unemployed, they have a certain social security system. If not, they're not. And these B citizens are becoming are the majority. So either we bring these instances within European politics and within European discussion for real, with European trade unions, with basic trade unions that are not anymore the trade unions that we know about trade, but they are trade unions about living standards and minimum income guarantees and so forth. Italy, by the way, doesn't have a minimum income guarantee. Then, then that's the problem. So, I mean, you're right. It's hard, heterogeneous, complex. But if we don't do it, the specter is, is, is pretty, pretty bad. And it's already materialized in Europe in many instances. So we really need to be brave and think a lot, think radically. Uh, well, by radically, I, I really use the notion that Marx originally used for radicalism. 
Radical it doesn't mean to be extreme. Radical, radical means to go at the root of the problem. The word uh, radical is the same root in Italian of the root of, of plants in the land. Radicale, rad, rad, R-A-D, is the definition. And it means to go at the root of problems. We're not doing it. Politics is not doing it. Politics doesn't go at the root of the problems of these citizens. And hence, is unable to respond. Because probably at the national level, politics cannot respond anymore in Europe to the challenges uh, that we're facing. So, if we're able to bring resistances within the European Union, even you know, we'll disintegrate that and, and then we'll see what happens. But uh, you know, I'm a social scientist, so I hope for the positive scenario and then right along this line, but I don't know if it's gonna happen. And there's another thing that you need to look at. I say that a bit. The working class didn't exist before the people invented it. It was not natural that people working in factories would develop a conscious of class fights and so forth our struggle and whatever. It was not a given. It took 60, 70 years. And it started from trade unionism and it went into politics afterwards. Now we maybe don't have a channel of social representation as we used to have, and we have to invent new ones. I don't know, I and mean, I don't have answers. I, you know, I'm observing and I'm trying to understand what happens in the, around me. So you're perfectly right. But it's a question of how you read that. If you read this heterogeneity, which is clearly there, as impossible to be surrounded, or as a way, a way to be surrounded. And, and from a research point of view, I think an interesting agenda that I want to approach in the future is to really look at the conditions of these workers beside the contracts, I was saying, in terms of wealth, assets, and see how people are mapped into the social reality and rethink how, how they can conceptualize themselves. It's the only way we have to bring the questions of these people to the But I'm a social scientist. This is the job of politics. Well, yeah, yeah. I cannot say I'm a political scientist in Paris, but I can say it here. That I need to be a sociologist. I did study political science, so yeah. Yeah.